And, and so next we have um, Sonny White uh, is gonna give us a talk on his dynamic vacuum model. Uh, Sonny is currently heading up the Limitless Space Institute where he's trying to push the state of the art both in um, you know, more esoteric things like wormholes or harvesting energy from the vacuum, uh, but to more practical things like uh, generating fusion for uh, fast space travel, using fusion for uh, space travel. And I think he's gonna talk about that. Uh, and so I've uh, known and respected Sonny for a really long time. He's always has uh, wonderful ideas of how to do something different, but um, what's, what to me is really the most impressive is he goes out and tries it and he makes it and he tests it. And then he puts it out there for people to talk about and uh, you know see what other people think about it, get feedback on that, uh, publish in journals, and so, um, and then adapt and move on. So it's really an impressive way of doing this, uh, pushing the frontier science. And Sonny, I just really appreciate the work you have done. Uh, uh, pushing us along and pushing yourself and the ideas along. So with that, uh, uh, I think, John, I think you might need to stop sharing. I'm not sure I can do that. Can, can you guys see my chart? I got the limitless space. Uh, this is your chart up. Yes, yes, we can see it now. Okay, we're good? Yeah, we're good. Thank you, Sonny. Okay. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Charles, for the very... Uh, kind and uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, definitely a, a lot of respect for you for also being somebody that kind of wants to uh, push the boundaries of, uh, of the things that we know. You know, you heard me talk about in a previous comment. Um, if you think about physics as a Venn diagram today, there's there's two circles on it and they touch at a tangent point. Uh, and the words general relativity is in one circle and quantum mechanics is in the other. And those two circles don't overlap, right? And so we, we know just from that simple uh, visualization of the, the body of knowledge of physics in the Venn diagram form that there is a more generalized understanding. And so people like yourself and John Bush and Eval Dagon and uh, a number of other people I've heard uh, on this, uh, in this meeting are, are trying to push the boundaries of what we know and move into what we don't know to, to fill in the, the difference. So uh, kudos to John and, and yourself and, and all the others. So thank you for being willing to you know, try and make a difference and make people uncomfortable, as David Lewis said. <laughs> right. Uh, before I get started, I just want to do a quick uh, uh, five-minute overview of, of where I'm at now and, and what I'm doing. And I worked at NASA uh, for 19 years uh, here at uh, Houston at Johnson Space Center. Uh, did a lot of stuff in flight support, worked uh, advanced power and propulsion, uh, trying to get things like hull thrusters put into human space flight and nuclear reactors and uh, a lot of other things. Got an opportunity in, in the tail end of 2019 to come, ha come help stand up this nonprofit institute called the Limitless Space Institute. Um, and it seemed like the uh, right thing to do after a lot of prayer and consideration. And so I pulled the D ring and, and came over and joined the Limitless Space Institute as the director of advanced R&D uh, and started to, help, started to help stand up the organization and, and define what, it, uh, what it's gonna be and, and what it's gonna do. Uh, so our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation to travel beyond our solar system and to support the research development of enabling technologies. Um, that is a, a very bold statement. Um, our big, hairy, audacious goal, as our president, BK, would say, is to enable interstellar travel by the turn of the century. Uh, that does tend to align with a couple other organizations that have talked about things like this uh, uh, in, in, the, in the press and, and some of their formal meetings. Um, but that is monstrously difficult. You know, when you think about space travel today, um, we are planning on sending human beings back to the surface of the moon, uh, ideally in 2024. Um, and we, we've got some wonderful uh, video from a rover that's on the surface of Mars. It's giving us all kinds of neat uh, pictures. We, some folks may be aware of the James Webb Space Telescope launched the other day and went through all these different uh, unfoldings, uh, you know, next generation uh, observatory. And so when we think about space exploration, that's kind of what's in our head in terms of the, the conventional wisdom of things. Um, <clears throat> but if you, if you want to do things like send human beings from Earth to Saturn in uh, 200 days, uh, the amount of energy that's necessary to make something like that possible is an order of magnitude larger uh, than the energy density it takes to get a payload from the surface of the Earth 
uh, to low Earth orbit. And so all that to say, chemical propulsion will not uh, will not close that type of uh, architecture. So, I mean, simply put, that means we need new forms of power and propulsion to be able to close some kind of a concept like I just described, you know, humans to Saturn in, in 200 days, let alone interstellar. So, I mean, what can we do? What, what hope is there? If chemical propulsion doesn't come close, what could we do? Uh, this is our little simple capability chart that we've developed uh, over a, a, a number of discussions we've had with, with different stakeholders. Uh, there are always lots of different things that one could also explore that people might say, hey, could you put, what about this or what about that? These, uh, this is a kind of a, a simple free swim lane articulation of how we view the trade space, um, uh, kind of spanning things from what we know on your left to what we, what we don't know on your right. Uh, so in the far left swim lane, in the, uh, you've got, this is in the category of known physics, known engineering, we could potentially use a, a power and propulsion architecture known as nuclear electric propulsion. And so this is where we have a nuclear reactor. Uh, can you guys see my mouse when I move it on the screen? Uh, yes, we can, yes. Okay, you have a nuclear reactor that's fissioning uranium, providing power, and you could route that power to some form of electric propulsion, pick your, your favorite version that ionizes the gas and accelerates it. Uh, and so this type of, uh, of uh, architecture, if it's, in the, if it's in the power levels of megawatts, um, you know, that's the kind of power levels that are necessary for human exploration types of missions. Uh, and to, to put that in context, uh, a standard garden variety locomotive is between two and three megawatts. Um, but uh, nuclear electric propulsion in this megawatt range enables human exploration of the entire solar system. We can send human beings to every destination in the solar system, this type, type of uh, power propulsion architecture. It would also enable interstellar precursors, maybe out to a thousand uh, astronomical units. That's the, the distance from the, uh, uh, the Earth to the sun, uh, laid out a thousand times. Uh, but it's not quite as effective at uh, interstellar. It's not impossible, but you just have to wait a really long time, like thousands of years, a couple thousand years. But it is an improvement on chemical propulsion. Chemical propulsion might still take, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years, up to you know, 50, 60, 70,000 years just to get the Proxima Centauri with chemical propulsion. So chemical propulsion is this invisible swim lane that's off to the left. Uh, fission improves things and gives us solar system and interstellar precursors. But if we want to do an interstellar mission in, uh, you know, uh, a time frame that's a little bit more compatible with the uh, an entire span of a human lifetime, uh, then we need to switch to a different power source and move a little bit into the unknown uh, uh, and switch to fusion. So instead of having fission, where we're fissioning uranium, uh, splitting it apart, uh, here we would switch to a power system that uses fusion, where we're, we're burning a plasma, if you will, using deuterium and tritium together uh, and generating power as a result. And you could have just a simple plug and play where you change the reactor out and you have fusion electric propulsion. But more than likely, what we're going to do is we'll actually use the fusion reaction itself to actually generate the thrust as well to eliminate efficiencies. Uh, and then with this kind of an architecture, you can actually have uh, velocities, spacecraft with uh, velocities that are in a couple percent the speed of light, like 5% the speed of light is something that is uh, doable with this kind of an architecture. You're automatically talking a lot more power level with this type of uh, approach in the hundreds of megawatts. Uh, this would certainly enable fast human exploration of the outer solar system. Uh, for folks that are online, uh, if anyone's familiar with the TV show Expanse, that's actually the, their, their preferred propulsion system that they show in, in the TV show. But I think that, that is a, it's kind of based on some scientific fact, if you will. Uh, fusion has a lot, of, a lot of value proposition and as a power and propulsion system for a spacecraft. And it does enable interstellar, at least somewhere in the range of maybe 50 to 100 years uh, to another star system that's within four to six type uh, light years, if you will. Um, this is all based on known physics. We understand fusion, it's a real thing. It's what makes the star work, uh, our, our sun work. Uh, we've been able to do small things with fusion and other more destructive things that use fusion. Uh, but we don't have the engineering worked out. We don't have that, um, that, uh, that Iron Man little reactor that uh, fits in uh, Tony Stark's chest. Uh, uh, so there's a little bit of engineering to, to be done here. But this might be closer than people think. Uh, there's been some significant developments in um, material science uh, associated with things like RECO high temperature superconducting tape. But what if we want to do an interstellar mission in a fraction of a human lifetime? That's where we kind of need to look to the frontiers of physics. 
right? Uh, the idea of a, a, you know, a space drive or a wormhole or space warp, we know general relativity says that uh, wormholes and space warps are mathematically possible. We just don't know what to build to, to make these things a manifest reality. So in the process of trying to develop that Venn diagram you heard me talk about uh, with a, a more complete understanding, maybe that'll provide us with new insights uh, in the realm of physics uh, that gives us new ways to propose on how to generate a force. Can we, can we actually push off of space time itself? Can we push off the quantum vacuum? Whatever type of uh, manifold or mathematical representation you want to think of. Can we create some asymmetry? We, we talked about that a little earlier at the tail end of, of Ford's discussion. In, uh, in, the, in the, 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 the fabric of, of, of space and time and, and allow us to generate a force uh, so we don't have to have a big propellant tank uh, to ex accelerate the propellant out the back of a spacecraft to, to generate force. And these types of the ideas might allow us to do an interstellar mission that's in maybe tens of years or maybe even less, right? To, if the ideas of space works or wormholes could potentially be reduced to practice one day. So that's kind of the way we, uh, that's, that's who we, LSI is. It's how we view the trade space. Uh, just some of the things that we're doing in, in the process of trying to track to that, that, um, that goal that we have. Um, you know, we are doing organization. We conduct research internally in our EcoWorks laboratory. Um, I'll talk about that in the next section of the presentation. Uh, we, um, uh, in the summer of 2020, we stood up a program we call Interstellar Initiative Grants. Uh, it's where we put out a solicitation to the world to allow people to uh, submit uh, proposals for interesting ideas they had to explore the frontiers of, of physics uh, as it pertains to those three swim lanes I articulated. Uh, we got a bunch of proposals in. We funded nine teams covering topics, research topics ranging from beamed energy propulsion, uh, relativistic solar sails, fusion propulsion. We have four teams doing fusion propulsion. Uh, two working on the idea of space drives and then one working on uh, traversable wormholes. I believe you've heard from two of the performers uh, during Charles's uh, uh, presentation or, or conference, uh, Charles's team is, is one of the teams that we, we funded. Uh, well, so Charles, along with Yuval Dagan, uh, and then of course uh, John Bush uh, with Adam K. So we we funded those two teams to do some work on the frontiers of physics as it might pertain to the idea of the space drive. Uh, and this is in partnership with uh, Texas A and M uh, and Breakthrough Initiatives, and we will likely put out another solicitation in May of this year. Uh, hopefully we can actually increase the purse a little bit. Maybe we can uh, uh, do a little bit more in this uh, next two-year biennial cycle of interstellar initiative grants. We also have um, university partnerships. <clears throat> this is where we partner with universities that have similar interests to us. Uh, these could be potentially quid pro quo, or they could be where we directly fund the university to do some work. Uh, currently, we're engaged in a, 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 a formal a relationship with Texas A&M paying their nuclear engineering department to do some very detailed work on a one to 10 megawatt electric nuclear reactor uh, for potential use on earth and with an eye towards making this design forward adaptable for space. Uh, there's a DOD program called Project Pele uh, that has a lot of uh, uh, similar uh, objectives. And so we're taking those requirements and adding a few more uh, to kind of come up with a paper reactor that we can then go back to members of Congress and say, hey, if you establish requirements that add just a few additional shall statements, we could potentially have a, a portable nuclear reactor that we, we use in space, I'm sorry, we use on the earth that's uh, easily modifiable for use in space to try and track towards that leftmost swim lane you remember me talking about. Uh, we have student programs, internships, uh, fellowships. We're actually gonna be uh, potentially bringing more to bear on this, uh, funding uh, postdocs and graduate students for uh, two years of, of work. Uh, we'll look. Uh, keep checking with our website for that and keep looking for that. Uh, we teach classes. We, we commissioned a class on interstellar studies this past summer uh, with the uh, Initiative for Interstellar Studies. Uh, we'll probably be doing another class uh, this summer. So again, watch our website for that. Uh, and in terms of partnerships, we've got formal engagements with over 20 organizations. Uh, we have several more in work. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to move fast and, and do what we can and, and help support the uh, community. Uh, so with that, I'm going to switch and talk about the work that we're doing internally on uh, our dynamic vacuum model um, as it pertains to some work that we've been uh, <clears throat> awarded to do uh, as a result of the DARPA program. Um, you know, it's, it, it's great to, to hear from some of the other, other folks talking about things today about um, trying to develop a, a deeper understanding of, of the quantum vacuum and, and the nature of things. 
that's very much kind of the, the, the same zip code that we are in with the things that we're thinking about with uh, our dynamic vacuum model. Um, we're doing this work in partnership with uh, Texas A&M, uh, Isentis. <clears throat> and as we move into phase three, a potential phase three, we'll be rolling in uh, UC Davis. Uh, we may actually have two additional partners that we may uh, roll in as well, two additional universities. So this is the, um, the quick summary of uh, what we're trying to do. And then I'll kind of unpack some of the, the physics and math here. Uh, we're trying to explore our dynamic vacuum model. Um, there are some potential technological implications of the dynamic vacuum model when you apply it to the idea of a casimir cavity. Uh, we developed some custom casimir cavity geometry. Uh, we published a paper in the literature uh, uh, in JBiz back uh, in 2020. Uh, kind of exploring some implications of having casimir cavities with uh, some specific and purposeful geometry placed in the middle uh, to, in effect, kind of create uh, a, a, an asymmetry, if you will, such that we could potentially do things that are interesting and useful, uh, both from a, just a pure scientific perspective to measure and explore it, but also from a technological perspective in the form of maybe generating uh, modest but uh, persistent power uh, perhaps we could find ways to increase the ma magnitude of negative vacuum energy density that one could generate inside one of these cavities. Uh, we, we conjecture that uh, we may be able to have new forms of communications and sensors uh, based on uh, something we would call longitudinal waves in the quantum vacuum. I'll kind of unpack that in a second on another slide. Uh, and then these, uh, these devices, uh, if, they're, if they have the appropriate to geometry, like a tapered geometry, they may be able to generate a force as well. Uh, however, the, uh, the, the, the wet blanket on that statement is, is, can one make the Newtons per kilowatt higher than a photon rocket? And it, 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 uh, it, it may not be able to do that, but uh, there might be ways for us to increase that so that the Newtons per kilowatt could be of interest relative to uh, some kind of a, a space application. You see a couple of um, scanning electron microscope images of some of the, the prototypes that uh, uh, we produced as part of the phase one and phase two work. Uh, this, is, this has been pretty hard to, to make these things. It's uh, not very easy. Uh, these dimensions are very small. It's almost like we're building a paramecium from scratch, uh, if you will. So these, uh, these dimensions that you see, we could actually lay a paramecium across this, this uh, thing and actually probably across all these pictures. <laughs> These are almost all the, the similar scale, um, but uh, we're, it's really, the dimensions we're working at are really small and we're actually looking to try and move into the nanometer uh, regime and some of the work we wanna do uh, in, the, in the near future. So, that, and that just makes it more, even more difficult. So the dynamic vacuum, what is it, right? You, we heard um, uh, John Bush talk about some awesome work that he's doing with the hydrodynamic quantum field theory. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're very interested in his work and it, it, as we continue to move forward, it would seem there are similarities from both our perspectives and we, we do maintain a lot of uh, regular dialogue. Um, we, you know, John Bush and I are both uh, interested in the premise of the concept of a pilot wave theory, both in terms of the, the history and the people, but also for the, the potential value of maybe moving into a, a deeper understanding of things. Um, in the past, the premise of pilot wave theory compared to you know, the standard model of quantum mechanics has often been discussed as being a uh, ontological uh, type of perspective, right? That uh, while they effectively, they kind of both predict the same things. Uh, and so therefore it's, they, they don't predict anything different. Uh, at least that's what a, the historical perspective was. They don't predict anything different. So it's, it's just a matter of which flavor ice cream that you like, you know, one person likes strawberry, another person likes uh, chocolate. Um, but the, the pilot wave theory does indeed make predictions that quantum mechanics doesn't make. Uh, and further, quantum mechanics wouldn't even be allowed to conjecture. Uh, you know, you, uh, John Bush talked about surreal uh, uh, trajectories. You know, if you try and figure out and understand what's, what's the more detailed understanding of what happens to the double slit experiment, right? Uh, those Bohmian trajectories that come out of a double slit experiment um, that prediction comes from, those are Bohmian trajectories, and that comes from the mathematics of, of pilot wave theory, uh, and uh, that, is, uh, that is not allowed in the, in the context of, of quantum mechanics to try and see what's happening between the double slits and the detector. So in some ways, in my mind, that makes it an epistemological type of perspective, right, where it's, they, they're not, it's not just two different flavors of ice cream. They're fundamentally different, and one makes predictions that the other one does not. Uh, and we can go potentially explore those uh, in the lab. And so in my mind, 
this may be uh, some of the ideas that, that would be categorized as a pilot wave theory. If you go back to my little verbal metaphor of the, uh, the Venn diagram of the two circles, uh, pilot wave theories are potentially trying to maybe develop a little bit more overlap between those two circles and maybe uh, color in between some of the gaps with new circle, if you, if you will. So uh, maybe a more generalized understanding. So long background, uh, just to simply try and highlight our perspective on uh, what we, you know, the, the approach that we take in trying to understand uh, a deeper understanding of the quantum vacuum. We think the quantum vacuum is a dynamic medium. Uh, we think it can vary both uh, in space and time, uh, and not just with arbitrary scales, if you will. We think it's just inherently baked into the nature of it. Uh, so as such, uh, it can sustain longitudinal wave modes. Uh, if you think back to what Ford was, was saying, he did talk about, uh, even in his perspective from quantum field theory, uh, it, you know, he talked about energy density fluctuations. In effect, that's, uh, uh, that's another type of word that one could, could potentially use to set up a a logic bridge to, to then say longitudinal waves. Uh, so uh, in, in some cases, there's it was an interesting for me to hear uh, Ford talk about that. Uh, but we think that the quantum vacuum, because it can vary in space and time, it can manifest longitudinal wave modes. Uh, and then fundamentally from a logic perspective, that means that the inter internal constituents of the medium can interact and exchange energy and momentum. Uh, now, we did some work uh, both in 2016 and then again in, in 2019, after we did some more uh, detailed study of the, the Schrodinger equation, uh, we showed that uh, electron orbitals are acoustic resonances in the dynamic vacuum. So we built a model of the hydrogen atom. Uh, we, we derived a density field and a velocity field for the dynamic vacuum medium as it uh, changes density moving away from the proton. Uh, and then we solve for the eigenfrequencies of that system. And the eigenfrequencies of that system, of course, in this case, are the acoustic resonances of the medium. Uh, in the paper I've highlighted on the bottom in Physics Open, we derive the, 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 uh, the, the wave equation, the Helmholtz equation, for, directly from the Schrodinger equation. Uh, and in the, in the process of doing that, we go through, uh, uh, I think John Bush had a great chart where he showed the Schrodinger equation after an appropriate coordinate transformation uh, yields what are called the Madelung continuity equations. And using those Madelung continuity equations that were derived back in 2019, you can go through a process and arrive at the acoustic wave equation uh, and then go through that allows you to then say, does this system have acoustic resonances and what are their energies? And so when we go through and we solved for those in the work that we did in 2019, uh, uh, we were able to show that uh, the energy of those acoustic resonances match what's predicted from quantum mechanics. And that really probably should not come as any surprise. We derived the acu acoustic wave equation directly from Schrodinger. So it's almost like by inspection, it, did, it, you know, it, it should have been obvious that of course we would see that. Uh, uh, but uh, it, you still, it was nice to be able to go through the, the detailed numerical analysis and show that. We, uh, as part of that work, uh, we also speculated that this may uh, have, have bearing on uh, molecular chemistry, if you will. And so we modeled a molecule, a hydrogen molecule with two atoms, uh, and then showed that the acoustic resonance of that system matches the energy level, the binding energy level of, of hydrogen. And so it's interesting to think that the same technique we use to model the hydrogen atom by itself can also be used to show that, that the hydrogen molecule is also an acoustic resonance in the same underlying field, and it has the correct energy. Uh, we went through and used a, a Wood-Saxon potential. We created a density field, a velocity field for the proton itself uh, and solved for the eigenfrequency of that system and the, uh, eigenfre the energy of that system, the energy of the acoustic resonance of that Wood-Saxon potential matches the predicted energy uh, for the proton. But that's, um, that's probably the least mature of the work that we've done. Uh, the electron orbitals is the most mature. We've done a lot more work there. Uh, so the, the nuclear, I would probably call that at best, that's kind of a, a green banana, but it's, uh, it's at least in the zip code of interesting. Uh, we did go through and, and uh, um, at the behest of one of my um, team members, Jerry Vera, uh, asking about, we've long talked about is gravity an emergent phenomena? Again, you know, trying to figure out ways to have these two circles on the Venn diagram uh, have a better overlap. Uh, is there some kind of uh, dynamics of this uh, uh, dynamic vacuum field, long, long wavelength, uh, dynamics of this dynamic vacuum uh, that could also potentially help us under, better understand gravity. Uh, and so when we developed a, um, 
dynamic vacuum uh, density field for the sun's gravitational, uh, uh, gravitational field and the, the corresponding velocity field. And then when we solve for the eigenfrequencies of that system, we uh, the frequencies for that, the eigenfrequencies for that system, these are acoustic resonances, but just super long wavelengths, if you will. Uh, when we solve for the eigenfrequencies for this system, uh, the eigenfrequencies match the known orbits for Mercury all the way out uh, to Pluto. Of course, Pluto, the error was uh, pretty significant uh, because there's, a, there's potentially, you know, if, if gravity is quantized, it is only soft quantized. It's not like hard quantized like the hydrogen atom uh, because there's a lot of perturbations uh, at this scale where the magnitude of any local potentials that might exist to create preferred record grooves, if you will, around the star, there's a lot of dynamics that are on, on the same scale that can perturb something and uh, take it out of a, a, a natural swim lane, if you will, and, and change it. So obviously Pluto has had a lot of multi-body interaction that might explain the, the, you know, I think it's like 16% error is what we got on Pluto, but some of the, these others were down to 0.2% error. So the work that we're doing for <clears throat> DARPA in the process of trying to understand things, we're, you know, we're trying to model how the quantum vacuum responds to the presence of this, uh, this custom Casimir cavity geometry you saw me show uh, in both cartoon and the, the stuff we've been able to manufacture. Uh, and in the process of studying the literature, we came across a technique called the numeric worldline approach uh, as applied to the Casimir uh, phenomenon. And so uh, when we looked into this, it also predicts that the, the quantum vacuum has spatial variation. Uh, so this is very interesting to us. And when we look closer into the, the mathematical formalism of it, you know, it's based on uh, 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 an effective action technique. This is like a, a string theory inspired approach uh, where you go through and you model <clears throat> Uh, scalar. So this is a uh, this is a, a vacuum fluctuation of a massless scalar field, and I see it rotating around. This is um, a scalar of vacuum fluctuation numeric world line of it. Uh, and when you go through and, and take a look at some geometry, you can use this uh, effective action technique uh, to calculate the predicted density distribution in the quantum vacuum in response to any potentials you have. And when I say potentials, I mean like real structure that exists, whether it's walls, pillars, whatever, those, that kind of a potential, if you will. And so, you know, if I were to, to describe this, you know, mathematically, this, uh, this half of the equation, this kind of represents the, do the, do the, the scalar vacuum field fluctuations uh, uh, impact the, uh, the structure and at what scale did they impact the structure so that you can then go through and integrate how much of the energy density, uh, negative energy density contribution uh, they contribute uh, to the, 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 how the quantum vacuum responds at a particular point. If I were to describe the, the muffin making recipe in, in uh, just kind of simple terms, uh, we have a, a computer algorithm that goes to and generates um, uh, an ensemble of scalar vacuum field fluctuations, uh, n sub L number of vacuum fluctuations, each one of those loops, this is these, each one of these is a closed loop, having n sub p points, right, in terms of this randomness that uh, defines the, the, the vacuum fluctuation. We move that entire ensemble to a particular point in space that we're interested in, in some kind of geometry. In this case, it's just, I'm just, you know, sticking with the simple model with two parallel plates. And then we scale the vacuum fluctuation until such point that the ray tracing algorithm would show that the scalar vacuum field fluctuation uh, penetrates the bounding potentials, however many you might have and whatever geometry they might be. And so once you do, do that, that helps define the support uh, that uh, helps us set the, uh, the boundaries on uh, this part of the integral. Uh, and this automatically makes this true. This is, this, and when you look at the mathematics, this is either a zero or a one uh, if this, uh, this vacuum fluctuation penetrates two or more uh, bodies. And so you do this for, uh, at a particular point, you do that for every single loop. Uh, in the ensemble and you uh, increase the deficiency of vacuum energy at that point by the weighted amount for everything that satisfied those equations and at what energy it satisfied those equations. And then you do that for every grid point in space. Uh, so this, you know, this approach is very powerful. Uh, you can use it to uh, look at almost any kind of geometry. Uh, actually, you can use it to look at any kind of geometry period dot. There are actually no qualifiers. Uh, it can handle uh, infinite, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very, very sharp geometry. So, you know, typically we always think of parallel plate uh, Casimir force when you look at the energy density distribution. 
some folks may have heard of, you know, sphere plate type of interaction. That's a, a very active area of empirical work. Uh, but you also have a blade plate type of interaction. Uh, it's hard to calculate this using anything else but uh, a numeric roll line technique because this is, uh, you know, there's this is basically a point, if you will. Uh, but the uh, numeric roll line approach handles that just fine. Uh, it also handles edge conditions. So it can go through and predict how does the perturbation of the quantum back and expand into free space out and away from the bounding potentials that define whatever you're trying to explore uh, to see how the, the Casimir phenomena manifests itself. Uh, and so our algorithms, we looked at all the standard textbook uh, uh, approaches to go through and show that we calculate the proper Casimir force for the, the standard examples. Uh, this also, this plot shows the energy density distribution for a parallel plate uh, system. And then you've got a plate sphere system with the gray line, and then you have a plate and a blade uh, with the orange line. Uh, so you can see two things here. You can see the magnitude being impacted by the change in the optics. Uh, and furthermore, you can also see there's a shift of where the, uh, the maximum occurs based on just how the right potential changes in geometry from a, a plate to a sphere to just a, a simple blade. Uh, we can go through and do our analysis for any particular geometry, uh, and then we can import the results uh, into COMSOL. And if we want to do something like measure the Casimir force, uh, we can use COMSOL to help us go through and measure the Casimir force. You kind of see, uh, you know, this is the, the sphere plate. You see the distribution of uh, force on the surface of this, uh, this sphere. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the beauty of the numeric world line technique is we, this could be anything we wanted it to be. I could, I, I'm going to say this as a joke. I could take a 3D scan of, uh, 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 <clears throat> of Charles's face and, and I could go through and calculate the Casimir force of Charles's face with this plate, uh, you know, it's just a, uh, just requires a whole lot of CPUs because uh, you have to create um, uh, vacuum fluctuation loops that have a, a large number of uh, uh, fluctuation steps. Uh, but we could calculate that, you know, and you could calculate it between two different very complicated objects, three or four or five or six. There's no limitation uh, to uh, the number of bodies or the arbitrariness of the shape. Uh, it just requires CPU horsepower. So. It is a very, very powerful technique, uh, but it uh, does require uh, quite a bit of computational capability to do it. Uh, you see here a couple examples of uh, different uh, discretizations of loops. Uh, this is a 100 point loop, a 500 point loop, a 1000 point loop, 5000 point loop, and then I mean, you can go all the way up to a million. And the reason you would, you would move to the right here is any local curvature that you have that starts to get small. Like let's say if this sphere had little, uh, points on it. Uh, you'd want to make these fluctuations get, to get smaller so that they, they would be smaller than any of the, the weird anomalous geometry you might have on your structures. So that, that's kind of what drives you to more points per loop. Uh, and then the number of loops you have, uh, the combination of number of points and number of loops is what affects the fin final uh, precision of the predicted answer, uh, especially if you have the ability to compare it to an analytic result. Uh, so in, uh, these are just synopses of the, the methodology that we worked out as part of our DARPA phase one, phase two. Uh, for our case one cavities, where we have parallel plate cavities, uh, we can use our numerical world line analysis technique to come up with a prediction for the energy density distribution. And so here you see, you know, we've got this effectively kind of like uh, three different potentials here. You got the, you got the wall, we've got a pillar and another wall. Uh, and so this is no longer just the simple uh, parallel plate cavity, we've got a, a third item in here that kind of, in, in our estimation, helps us set up a, uh, a slight asymmetry in this system uh, where we've got this, uh, these two little lenticular energy density distributions that are on either side of the pillar. Uh, but this sets up a situation so that the pillar sees a very different uh, uh, background vacuum fluctuation field than the, the, the bulk material of the walls would see. Uh, uh, so when we go through and look at this energy density distribution, we can import that into COMSOL uh, and then correlate that to an electric field magnitude. This is based on some work we published in uh, the Journal of Modern Physics back in 2015. Uh, once we get the electric field magnitude, we can go through and calculate the, using COMSOL, calculate the divergence of the electric field, which leads us to a, this is kind of the predicted polarization field in the quantum vacuum, if you will. Uh, so having this pillar, 
uh, inside this uh, global casimere cavity uh, sets up so that we have this, uh, this polarization field that appears that when we then put in the, the material, the, the material characteristics of the bounding potentials, we can then calculate what is the electric potential? What if we were to try and query uh, the, the voltage potential uh, as measured between this, uh, this pillar and the wall, we can then predict what that is uh, using this numerical analysis technique. And then we can use that to compare to trying to explore that in the lab. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, for the case two, where we have tapered cavities, uh, we can go through and, and model the inter predicted energy density for a tapered cavity. Um, you kind of see it, it, it by having a tapered cavity, it creates this interesting scenario where the energy density uh, expands well out beyond the, the cavity. I think if I rotate this here, uh, you can kind of see the cavity rotating. Uh, but this purple area that's like the, this very high negative, high magnitude negative vacuum energy density. Uh, expands well out into free space uh, from the front end of this, of this cavity. Um, <clears throat> so that, that in itself is interesting, but we can use COMSOL with this to come up with predicted forces if we want to go through and explore the, the Casimir force. Uh, we can also use that as well over here for the case one to, to predict the Casimir force. I'll show you some of those results in a second. Uh, because one can go through and use an atomic force microscope to explore the, the Casimir forces with these custom Casimir cavities. Uh, but the interesting thing that in the process of exploring case two, uh, and I'll talk about this in a few minutes if I have time, um, if, you, if you look at this energy density distribution and you put this in a, in a large control volume, uh, you can ask the question, is in order to conserve energy and momentum, uh, looking at this from a Navier-Stokes perspective, is there a background field, velocity field that has to couple to this energy density distribution to conserve energy and momentum? So just you know, putting in standard simple boundary conditions that would make sense, uh, we find that there has to be a global flow field in the quantum vacuum in response to this energy density distribution uh, that's predicted from the numerical robot technique. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, you know, in, in the process of me saying that the quantum vacuum is a dynamic medium and it can sustain longitudinal wave modes. And then I also show some of the results of our analysis where, um, you know, atomic orbitals or acoustic resonances, if you will, uh, this all all kind of hangs around this premise of the fact that there are longitudinal waves that we can manifest. Uh, so that means I, I, what I'm what I mean to say is, is is this may mean we can transmit, you know, waves from some kind of a transmitter to some kind of a receiver. So having some kind of a tapered set of arrays looking at one another is there some way to stimulate uh, one relative to the other and have the other one detect a wake, if you will, in the velocity field of the quantum vacuum. So in terms of one way we want to explore the case one caps, uh, if there is a, uh, an electrostatic uh, potential uh, that is predicted to exist across these structures, uh, we can use an atomic force microscopes, uh, Kelvin probe force microscopy to go through and try and map out uh, any variation in potential as you scan across the surface of some particular sample you're interested in. <clears throat> so we have a, a a Cypher S atomic force microscope. <clears throat> it says asylum, it's actually been bought out by Oxford. Um, but the way the Kelvin probe force microscopy technique works is you have a, um, you have a probe tip that's mounted on your, mounted to your atomic force microscope and it is positioned above a sample that you're interested in studying. Uh, the probe tip is conducting. Uh, so the system has the capability of applying voltage, whether it's a uh, just the DC voltage or just an AC voltage or some combination of the two. Uh, and so the KPFM mode, the way it works is the uh, atomic force microscope will first, uh, so it, it scans a series of horizontal lines to create a two-dimensional picture if you're looking at a particular sample. And so for each one of those scan lines that it scans as it's building up that uh, two-dimensional image uh, looking down on a sample, uh, the first part of the scan line, it'll do an AC tap mode. Uh, where the, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing hand puppets in the little video, so I don't know if you can see me or not, but I'm trying to do hand puppets to augment the static graphics. It'll do an AC tap mode where that, uh, that tip of the, the AFM will tap across the top of the surface and create a topological map of the surface. Uh, if there's no voltage going to the conducting tip, that's all done just neutral. Uh, the KPFM tip will then lift from the surface some distance and do what's called like a, a flying a nap, a nape of the earth, if you will. Think of an airplane flying through a valley. 
Uh, it flies with some kind of an off offset. <clears throat> and while it's doing that, it applies an AC voltage to try and oscillate the tip. And then it applies a DC voltage with a control loop that's trying to minimize the amplitude of that oscillation uh, by applying a DC bias voltage. And when that DC bias, vo bias voltage at a particular point in the scan line uh, minimizes that amplitude of oscillation, then that means the, the uh, patch potential directly underneath the probe at that point in space is equal to the DC bias voltage that has been applied to the AFM tip. Uh, and so that's what allows us to go through and look at a sample and measure uh, any charge distribution that we might see on these custom casimir cavities. Another thing we'd like to do is try and directly measure, now let me go back just a second, this type of topological, this kind of a forensic study uh, will only allow us, if, if we were to see what we're looking for, I actually have some results I'll share with you, but if we see what we're looking for, those results would only tell us that these custom casimir cavities can manifest a local polarization field, but it doesn't mean that we could measure some global potential across these, uh, if you will. Uh, so maybe the quantum vacuum can manifest some polarization, but it still can't do work. So there's, there's another thing we have to do uh, to try and measure the global, and that's where uh, the approach of using a four-point probe technique where we, we've got a, a mechatronics uh, uh, probe station where we mount the test articles and we put in all of our different probes and then measure, uh, create the, um, uh, the ID curves for these samples and see, uh, do, they, do they generate a voltage potential? Do they provide some level of, uh, of current? Um, another question we have is, is this phenomena a DC phenomena? In other words, can we measure a global voltage potential uh, with, with some measurable current? Um, or is it, some, excuse me, can we measure it is it DC in nature or does it immediately collapse when you sample it? In other words, you, there's some level of energy in the, in the field, uh, in the cavities, you know, there's, a, separate, there's a, a volume of negative vacuum energy density. And so by sampling the system, do we then depolarize the field and we have to release the, the, the measuring sample and allow it to repolarize over some period? So is it a transient phenomena? And so for that, we have a, a, a high sample rate uh, oscilloscope that can measure 20, uh, 20 billion samples per second and try and see are, are there any temporal characteristics of this. Uh, and so we've, we've done a lot of work uh, to go through and predict what, you know, what type of voltages we might expect to see, whether they're, these are magnitudes, whether they're transient um, or whether they're DC uh, based on uh, what, what kind of geometry we, uh, we've, we've figured out over the last 18 months we can, we can manufacture. What is the, you know, if it's a transient nature, how long does it last based on how we've arrayed these things together in series and, and um, uh, parallel circuits? Uh, and then what's the maximum current that we might see? Um, so that's another way to potentially query it to see if there's some global potential that we can see. In other words, can we deflate the, the cosmic balloon, right? Remember from, from Ford's perspective, uh, it requires new physics to potentially find a new way to do that, right? Because quantum field theory uh, what did he say? Simple quantum field theory is a relentless bank banker that requires all bills be paid, right? Um, uh, but, you know, it, it, in my mind, physics isn't complete. So, yes, we need new physics. And maybe, maybe pilot with the idea that's wrapped up in pilot wave thought process, maybe it can provide us some ways to go do that. Um, so, these are some additional uh, SEM images of some of the things that we've manufactured along with some microscope uh, pictures. You kind of see these. Um, uh, these uh, walls and pillars, uh, sometimes we refer to them as skyscrapers and flagpoles uh, whenever we're trying to, to discuss them in our, in our meetings. Uh, but we have these things arrayed in, in different combinations of uh, parallel and in series to go through and study uh, some of these um, voltages and uh, maximum currents and discharge times, uh, depending upon what the, the global nature of these things might be. Um, this, this goes through and shows the uh, voltage potential for uh, some of the cavities that uh, we've been able to make to date in terms of the uh, separation gap. Uh, this is a 15 micron wall wall gap. We've managed to get down to seven micron wall wall gap. Uh, uh, these, uh, I think the, the 10 micron gap are the ones that we currently have in the lab. We have a full set for set D. Uh, and so we will potentially make set C and set A. We, we may actually make some that are even and uh, order of magnitude smaller when you get into the nanometer uh, range with the EV lithography. Uh, this shows the, uh, the, 
<clears throat> the results from Comsol applied to, in this case, this is a, a, a 60 by 100 cavity uh, test article uh, where we etched uh, these uh, cavities with a, this is a 10 micron gap here uh, with these pillars in the center. And we go through and, and use our numerical analysis technique you kind of saw me uh, stitch out previously. This helps us understand what are the, uh, what are the voltage potentials we might see as we try and query this thing using the Kelvin Pro Force microscopy as we scan individual little windows of it. The, the KPFM can you know, only schedule, uh, scan you know, up to 30 micron by 30 micron window. So it can't get the whole thing, but we can get nice uh, significant windows of, of, above these uh, skyscraper and flagpole uh, features of this uh, 6,000 cavity test article. Uh, we, um, we got uh, some of the, the conducting tips back in November of last year. Uh, we were doing some initial scanning. We managed to get uh, what we would call maybe a, a, a lucky try on some of our first few scans. Uh, this is uh, showing an image from the microscope looking at the, uh, the test article. Uh, you've got this diamond tipped uh, AFM. Uh, and you see the little scanning window that we scanned. This is actually a 20 micron by 20 micron window. And as we scan the AFM tip using the KF, KPFM mode, you can kind of see in this two dimensional picture here, there's a, a ghosting of what's representative of the top of the skyscraper, and then a ghosting of what's rep representative of the top of the pillar. Uh, and so the, the general level, voltage level of the, the bulk value here for the skyscraper is uh, higher volt, relative voltage to the voltage that we detect on the top of the pillar. Uh, you kind of see here in this three-dimensional view, this, uh, this ocean floor, if you will, is higher than this ocean floor. However, we have these nasty artifacts uh, along with these, this tearing, these lines that are indicative of tearing, uh, and it's extremely, extremely negative voltage here, here, and here. And you see it in this, uh, this picture, this uh, very erroneous uh, looking data right here. And it's like, well, what's causing that? What's going on? Is, is that real or is that some measuring artifact? Uh, so after we, you know, we thought about it for a long time, uh, did some additional scans, uh, and this is, uh, this is a consequence of uh, impact. Um, the um, <clears throat> kind of going back to those two slides I, I showed you about the, the Kelvin probe force microscopy, how it works. Uh, these probe tips will do an AC tap mode to establish the topography here. And so as it goes across this gap right here, it, it'll be tapped. Can everyone see my mouse? Uh, it's kind of important that you see my mouse. Uh, yeah, we can see your mouse. Okay, so as the AC tap mode goes across the surface of this, uh, this uh, cavity, when it sees this gap here, it's gonna wanna drive the tip down as far as it can. In theory, it would wanna go all the way down to the street level, if you will, if you think of the, these things as really being skyscrapers and long uh, flagpoles. It'll, it'll wanna go down to the street level, but obviously it can't. It'll actually strike uh, the side, the probe tip will run into uh, this, uh, this little pillar that's sitting up there. Uh, and then when it comes back flying in the, in, the, in the nap mode, when it gets this delta Z, right? It's not gonna have any issues when it's flying over the top of the, the cavity, or sorry, when it's flying over the top of the skyscraper, but anytime it gets close to these edges, there's this uh, very high aspect ratio. And so the, the AFM tip wants to drive down and either the structure will hit the bottom of the, uh, the AFM tip uh, somewhere in the middle of the beam and cause it to erroneously vibrate, which makes the system apply a large DC voltage thinking something's wrong, uh, or it'll literally run nose into structure and, and bend the tip down. Uh, that'll also confuse the system. Uh, and by the same token, it's those, those impacts are causing nanometer jit, uh, jitter of the, of the test article. Uh, and so that's uh, also the manifest of the, the tearing. Um, so we worked with um, Oxford Instruments to try and uh, figure out where there's some, some ways we can tweak how the instrument uh, does the KPFM scanning. Uh, what are some ways we can go through and try and improve the, the, the normal way it does things by some customization? Because of the fact we, we don't have a traditional sample. We have a sample that has this very large high aspect ratio gap. And so uh, KPFM, the, the native KPFMO was not made to scan that kind of topography. And so we work with them to try and figure that out. And this shows uh, uh, we, we really made a lot of progress last week. So you guys are seeing some stuff that's uh, right off the presses, if you will. Um, this shows a scan of the test article. Uh, 
uh, you can see these, these uh, certainly you can see the tearing here. In this picture, that the, the probe is scanning in this vertical direction, scanning uh, up and down. And so you, you see these large ridges, uh, discontinuity ridges, you can see them very much so here. You know, that's tearing in the system from that collision that's occurring. And you see all this, uh, these uh, low voltages, uh, and in some cases, high voltages, depending upon it, if it ran into it, head, head uh, nose first, or if it ran into it from the from the back end of the of the, the pillar when it was going the other way, uh, and so it just it you can see the geometry, and we we can see potential hints from that, but we can't tell anything from this. So this is, you know, even with some of the initial workarounds, with you know at this state we weren't able to get it. Uh, so we continued with some of the the techniques that we had developed with Oxford Instruments. We made another set of runs. You can see a slight improvement here. But you can definitely see there's still some um, uh, tearing in the, in the frames, uh, but you can see that uh, there's this cross coupling between the pillar and the, the wall here. Uh, so still some issues. We made some more changes, still see some issues. Looks like it might be heading in the right direction, but still not there. Uh, we continue to make uh, uh, changes. You see a continual improvement. Now we're starting to get to a point where we might be seeing the real data with only minimal cross coupling. You still see some level of shadowing from this pillar here. Uh, it's getting better, uh, and now this is definitely where a single scan, uh, we're not have, having any adverse collisions. The, the, the workarounds that we put in place with, with Oxford are finally helping us see the, uh, the relative potential of these flagpoles relative to the potential of the tops of the skyscrapers, if you will. Uh, and once we got into this mode, this allowed us to take a whole lot of data to then go through and average it uh, and create a, a, a much smoother uh, 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 data set. Uh, and this is just a three dimensional uh, little plot uh, where this is a 30 micron by 30 micron window where the height uh, you know, corresponds to this vertical axis here. That's the voltage uh, of the different surfaces relative to one another. And so you can see from here, the height of the pillars is lower than the height of the walls. So this predicts that the pillars will be at a negative voltage uh, relative, sorry, this doesn't predict, this is empirical data. This empirical data says that the voltage of the, of the tops of the pillars is lower than the voltage of the tops of the skyscrapers. So this is, uh, this is empirical data, not uh, prediction. This is data from the KPFM, a lot of data from the KPFM. Um, <clears throat> shifting over to some other things we want to explore uh, using the atomic force microscope. Uh, it can also measure the Casimir force. We can replace the tip with a, a tip that has a colloidal probe. Uh, in this case, we're doing some work to explore, you know, what, what diameter probe uh, uh, works best based on some of the commercial ones that are available. Uh, we may also engage with uh, UC Davis to make us a custom uh, colloidal tip that may even be up to about 100 microns in diameter. Um, but the beauty of the numeric world line technique is, as I said, uh, there's no limit to the, the amount of geometry that you have. There's no limit to the curvature. Uh, the analysis algorithms, numeric algorithms can, can handle any of this stuff. Uh, so that was actually the, the lion's share of work was working out the computer program uh, and the computational capability to do that. Uh, and so you see these are the results uh, imported in the COMSOL uh, for a 10 micron uh, system. We looked at uh, 20 micron system to understand what that looks like. Uh, and then, of course, this just shows it to import it in COMSOL. You see the, uh, the, the force distribution on the, the front end of the colloidal sphere as a result of the, the plate, pillar, plate uh, system. Uh, switching to the, to the tapered cavity, uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? What, like three more minutes? So maybe I'll cruise through this really quickly uh, so I can allow for a few questions. Uh, for case two, uh, tapered cavity, as I said, you know, this... Um, uh, energy density distribution here is uh, 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 quite interesting for this tapered cavity. It's very focused at one end. This is for a four micron uh, cavity with uh, six, four, four micron separation at the front, six micron at the back, 40 micron by 40 micron square. Uh, and that just goes through and shows the results. Um, when we looked at the energy density distribution, uh, you know, we, can, we can use this to calculate uh, if we put a spherical probe uh, here or here, or even at different locations, depending, we could manufacture these things where they're, you know, on a chip with the, you know, the, the, the taper sits down on top of the chip, or we could do it where it uh, opens up orthogonal to the surface of the chip. Uh, and so we can use our algorithms just to, you know, predict what the Casimir force would be at all these different locations. 
Um, but I think the thing that we're very interested in with these things is can we stimulate them to generate uh, longitudinal waves uh, or alternately, are there implications of this? Um, I'm gonna skip forward here a little bit to speed up. Are there implications of uh, uh, this energy density distribution requiring to be coupled to some type of a velocity field? Uh, when we look at uh, the results from both the um, laminar flow and the turbulent flow, uh, both, uh, both analysis modules and COMSOL do require a net velocity flow. Uh, further, there is this uh, uh, additional interesting focus point of, uh, uh, of pressure distribution in the field. Uh, maybe this would impact the magnitude of the Casimir force in addition to what just the uh, energy density distribution would be. Uh, but I think one of the things we'd really want to explore with this um, is the ability to transmit, I'm just jumping forward here to the, to the punchline with some of the other things we really, really want to explore. Can we transmit and receive longitudinal waves, if you will, uh, between an array of transmitters and array receivers uh, and study the impact of separation gap? Can we put uh, you know, different types of um, uh, shields or occlusions between here uh, that we can then ground and go through and see the impact that they have on, on the magnitude of what we might see? Uh, can we manufacture chasm cavities like this uh, where we can stimulate these pillars and then go through and see how does that impact the magnitude of the Casimir force uh, as we study that uh, over time. Um, I'll finish with this. Sometimes when you're doing fundamental research, you have accidental findings. Uh, when we were looking at the uh, plate, pillar plate uh, um, system, uh, we, you know, this energy density distribution looks very similar to what's required for the idea of the Alcubierre warp metric. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the general relativity field equations for that. Um, but they're not quite exactly what they need to be because these are uh, prismatic and they're not toroidal in nature. Uh, and <clears throat> what, we, what we would want is to have something that's toroidal in nature. So we, we went through and uh, developed a model that had a one micron diameter sphere in the middle of a four micron diameter cylinder. Uh, I did the numeric world line analysis and this generates a toroidal ring of negative vacuum energy density that. Uh, uh, very closely matches the requirements for the Alcubierre uh, warp metric. And so um, while this is, this is not a, a, a warp drive or anything like that, it's not going to go anywhere, it's not going to do anything, uh, but it's going to potentially have optical properties that are interesting. Uh, it's kind of like a maybe a, a broadband metamaterial. Uh, and so that might be something interesting to explore. Can we, uh, can we, you know, could this potentially have any impacts that we could measure using some spectrometry or spectrometry, or, you know, is there some, uh, uh, metamaterial studies that we can do with some laser optics. Uh, so those are some things that we'd like to think about moving forward. So um, with that, that's everything I had. Uh, maybe went just a minute over, so sorry about that. Thanks, Charles. Oh yeah, thank you so much, Sonny. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, hearing about all your recent results too and uh, starting to make some measurements, very exciting. Um, I know I have some uh, questions, but uh, the, uh, I'll just ask a couple of questions, then we could go to other people in the audience. Have you, do you think you could put in a uh, chemical potentials or other sort of um, voltages in the world line analysis? Uh, so, you know, I'm thinking of the work that Yuval and I are doing. We sure would like to um, look at a resonant tunneling diode with that technique. Uh, yeah, I've been, I, I've been thinking more and more about that. I, I think there is a potential way for us to do that, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's still a little, a little half-baked, but maybe that could be, be an opportunity for us to have, <clears throat> have some discussions in the, in the near future, try and figure out what that might look like. Yeah, that'd be great. And then one other question is, um, how do you go from the world line um, energy density or the, the world line uh, you know, negative vacuum to the console E field magnitude. How do you make the step going from, from the world line to the console? I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, we, uh, we published a paper in 2015 in the Journal of Modern Physics uh, where we were, you know, we were, this is where we were first kind of looking at the, the hydrogen atom, uh, showing that uh, uh, the, this density field that we thought existed around the hydrogen atom, uh, the eigenfrequencies of that would um, uh, match observation. Um, we used a, a heuristic density field and a heuristic velocity field for that analysis. Uh, so that was incomplete, but it was, but, but it still matched very closely, but it was, it was a little too heuristic by itself, which is why we did the other work we, we talked about in 2019. 
But during 2015, when we were looking at that, uh, we, we started thinking about um, the energy density that's in the hydrogen atom. At, let's just stick with the ground state for N is equal to one. Uh, for the ground state for N is equal to one, if you look at the energy density that's in that system, if you imagine a virtual Casimir cavity, if you will, whose distance is twice the Bohr radius, and you look at the energy density in the, in the Casimir cavity, it's identical to the energy density that's uh, the average energy density uh, that's around the hydrogen atom at that, uh, that, that ground state. Um, and so that, that correlation, and that's true for n is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can show that for multiple z numbers. Uh, and so that, that was something that sat in the back of our minds that there was this interesting analog between the, the Casimir phenomena and what we were modeling around the hydrogen atom in terms of this, this density field. Uh, but it was not complete at that time. Uh, and so in the 2018-19 timeframe, we kind of came back to it when we were developing a, a more fundamental model of the density field around a hydrogen atom, uh, basically taking the energy density in the electrostatic field and creating a density field associated uh, uh, with that. And then modeling that, uh, we, we, we got to thinking about the Casimir phenomena again, saying that we, you know, we, we drew this interesting corollary back in 2015 that these things seem to be, resemble one another. Uh, but we were only looking at the energy density. We didn't think anything at all about the, the, the is there any possibility of a, a global electric field? Uh, and so then we, we got to thinking about it again and said, well, well maybe it's, it's, you know, there is structure. There's a, a, a variation in the energy density structure that's manifest in those ca uh, Casimir cavities. If you just think about a, a parallel plate cavity. But then the question is, how could you see it? Number one. Number two, is it, is it AC where it just oscillates up and down? You know, each of the modes... It's like an RF mode, right? It just only oscillates up and down. And there's, there's no, you know, it always oscillates around zero. So there's no global variation in potential, right? So there's, there may be a variation in energy density, but there's no polarization field. Uh, then you get to the fact where if there is this energy density variation, then that means that the, uh, uh, the pillars that are in the center, if you put structure in the middle, that structure is going to see uh, a different amount of background fluctuation. And so you'll have different vacuum fluctuations that can interact with the, the, the real structure, if you will. And does that provide the ability to set up uh, for a, a, a variation in, in uh, uh, holes and electrons, if you will, to allow for some type of a potential to, to form uh, across two surfaces? Uh, but the, the, the formal calculation is just simply equating the energy density to a magnitude of electric field. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is the magnitude of that electric field, is it AC and it always oscillates around zero and there's no potential whatsoever? Or is it at least, at a, is it potentially a local phenomenon that we can measure with the, the KPFM? And then is it a global phenomenon we can detect using a four point probe or an LED or something? If you right, know, if you right. Okay, great, thank you. I think uh, uh, Zuni has his hand up, uh, has a question or comment. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm uh, like uh, like you asked. It's interested uh, about uh, its similarity to the Alkmaar uh, predicted field. So uh, since we've seen negative energy, but uh, have you tried, uh, say, uh, shooting light through a Casimir cavity and recording its speed uh, <laughs> to see if there's any indeed any warp effect? Uh, that, you know, that, the, that uh, I showed a slide of like the beginnings of a racetrack uh, where you had a series of those spheres and cylinders uh, aligned one after the other as a potential race course for uh, an electron or a photon or something to go to and, and measure that. But the, the question is, could you get that, the magnitude of that up to something that you could ever observe? Are there better approaches to try and measure that other than just the, you know, the traditional racetrack type of, of technique? Um, but it, that is one of the things we thought about. Is that a way you could explore it forensically? Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, do you think that could relate to the, um, the results you had seen previously of interference? Um, you were looking at interference fringes in a laser and, um, yeah, do you see a correlation there? Is that something you can discuss or? Yeah, I, maybe, um, yeah, it, it's yeah, it, it's too early to say. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, the other step was interesting, but it's too early to say. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tom. Hi, Tom. Uh, Tom has a question. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's a, a simple, a quick question, and that is, um, as Sony uh, was talking about longitudinal waves, 
I'm, I'm aware of the fact that um, some of the literature uh, regards them as scalar waves. And once you get into scalar waves, we even have, a, our institute has a report on scalar waves and potentials. I wrote an article on it years ago. Uh, you have the possibility of instantaneous transmission. It's not limited by the speed of light. And this is an exciting possibility for communication to Mars. And I wonder if Tony uh, recommends any further direction for that type of research of scalar wave reception over long distances. That, that's a that, that's a that's an interesting question, um, and obviously it's it's as David Lewis would say, those are the kinds of questions that would probably make us uncomfortable because we're starting to talk about John Bush talked about non-locality makes him uncomfortable, and and superluminal makes everyone uncomfortable. But that's a good question. So let's talk about that for just a second. Um, uh, Paul Stevenson uh, wrote a, uh, is a professor of physics at the Rice University wrote n numerous papers studying hydrodynamics of the quantum vacuum. And he looked at it from the cosmological scale, uh, yeah. but it was mo it was motivated by how a Bose-Einstein condensate behaves when you release it from a trap, and the process <laughs> of kind of you know from that motivation looking at things, he published a bunch of papers studying the hydrodynamics of vacuum. Uh, and when he looked at it, there was a potential for uh, uh, arbitrarily fast longitudinal waves that could move very very quickly. Uh, and so he uh, published a paper in you know a high high quality journal. So it's it's good stuff. You can Google Paul Stevenson hydrodynamics of the vacuum. Uh, and he was showing how maybe vacuum fluctuations, while still adhering to the local light cone, might you know conspiratorially behave in such a way that they could transmit a longitudinal wave uh, uh, very very quickly uh, through some kind of a medium. Uh, that that is yeah conspiratorially. What's that? I like the conspiratorially phrase. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, had, he he knew he was writing a book for. I uh, he was writing an article for a physics journal, so he had this had to say something about it. Right? Um, uh, but uh, yeah, that might be something interesting to explore. Uh, it 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 may not be necessary at all, but that that is something we, we've we've always kept in the back of our mind. Uh, there might be ways for things to because let, let's be honest, you know, longitudinal waves in the quantum vacuum that's potentially a, a whole new thing, if you will. Uh, and at scalar waves, whichever parlance you want to use. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of open questions, right? We can just arbitrarily assume that it's capped by C. And I'll be honest, that's what we've done in all of our analysis of, de of developing the velocity fields. Um, but, but we do acknowledge in our pa papers that we publish that that is ad hoc and it requires more work. And even in, in my discussions with John Bush, that uh, in, in that's the, the one open area we need to spend more time developing the dispersion relationship for our dynamic vacuum model. Yeah, I can send you the report and the uh, articles. Uh, and, and actually, uh, maybe we can uh, conspiratorially collaborate on forming the Mars telephone company that'll have okay. <laughs> delayed uh, communication between Earth and Mars instead of waiting, you know, several minutes for the reply. Right, right. right. Sure, send me an email. Uh, uh, right. uh, uh, sunny at All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great, any other questions or comments for Sunny? Actually, I've got another question if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I edited a book on Faster Than Light with uh, David Froning's work and hmm. Terrence Bear. Um, I, I basically was so impressed for the years that we had him as a speaker at our conference on future energy. I'd be happy to send you the review copy um, it has uh, half of the book is really dedicated to their published articles. Uh, they yeah, did I'd, I'd love to see that. I'm, I'm definitely familiar with the David Froning's uh, work. I always like to, to see what he was thinking yeah. about. It's interesting. Yeah, I'd love to, love to get a copy of that. Put that on my, one of my, I don't know if you can see my, no, you can't see my bookshelf. Before. That's where all the books are over there. There's some, <laughs> there's some over there, but most of them are over to my house. Yeah, and it, and it looks like there's some practical uses. They've tested on the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, uh, various uh, asymmetric toroids. So there's experimental uh, verification of uh, the theoretical work. Huh. I'd love to see that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay great. Well, thanks again, Sonny. I um, appreciate uh, your work as always. Uh, you think David will get active going or? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping so. I, I uh, Maybe in February, right? So. Right, right. I mean, we had that last email from him. He's waiting for final approval. Right, 
right, right, right. But then who knows how many of the teams will get to go forward and all that. So it'd be. Uh, and there's also the, there's also the complication of the continuing resolution too, right? So how did how right, does that right. impact? Well, no, they pass they pass the um, the defense budget. Oh, cool. Yeah, the defense budget is not under a continuing resolution anymore. So uh, that problem is gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm right, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. So uh, tomorrow is, uh, let me share my slide, uh, my, uh, the agenda real quickly. Um, tomorrow is mostly focused on gravity. So we're switching gears from vacuum fluctuations uh, onto gravity. So here's the marriage between those, that Venn diagram you talk about, Sonny, between, um, you know, quantum world and gravitational world, and they're not married together, right? They're on separate days. Uh, but also Martin Tamar is gonna talk about uh, his vast amount of work on testing uh, and development of revolutionary propulsion concepts. So that should be a very interesting discussion. George Hathaway is gonna talk in particular about uh, his experimental gravity work and also his search for anomalous forces so that's in the morning. And then we get really heavy into general relativity in uh, the afternoon. Lance Williams talking about the fifth dimensional Calusa scalar charge that uh, he is convinced is there and his uh, work to try to find that. Uh, Nathan is going to talk about um, transduction, um, not really as uh, gravitational induction and how we can, might be able to generate forces there. And as the lead in, to uh, Professor Ray Chow's work on transduction between EM gravitational waves. Uh, he thinks he's come up with a, a, an approach via quantum mechanics of converting between the two and then uh, with the potential of generating um, gravitational wave communication that would go through the earth, uh, et cetera. So very interesting work. This would be a really nice experiment to go off and do. So uh, thank you everyone for who, uh, joined us today and um, you know hope you can uh, join us again on Friday and then of course on Saturday is uh, the Sci Society for Scientific Exploration uh, their uh, their briefings on advanced energy concepts that challenge the second law and so that's an interesting set of talks on Saturday so um, we'll see you all tomorrow thank you